We have a around here. It may be Wednesday night, but we still believe in doing some shouting around here. We still believe in chasing the devil off around here, right? Hey, hey, hey. Amen. And, and, and this is honest truth. This is the perfect season to do it. See, he think he owned the summer, but the summer but still belongs to God. The Bible says to everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose. And guess what? God determined when he's going to have a purpose, a season inside of a season. See, what the enemy does to is this. He said, well, you know you got natural seasons that happen. And God said, listen, when I'm ready to create a season, it don't even have to be the season that you're supposed to be in. I can create it. Now, I'm going to give you some biblical, biblical principles on this. The Bible said the woman came to Jesus, and Jesus told her, he said, woman, my woman's not, my hour is not yet. And he said, look, it's not my time. So she got a little frustrated. And sometimes we get frustrated because it's not the time that it seems like it's right. But because of her persistency, man, because of her faith, Jesus took a season that was not her season and gave her the season that she needed. I don't know who needs that word right now. You may not be in your season, but God will bring a season in the middle of a season. It's all right. He knows how to turn, but the enemy has meant for harm for right. That's why the Bible says, I, I'm not the preacher, I better see it. Wind it down there. <laughs> Hallelujah! I'll finish that thought if you don't watch out. Tell your name, that pastor finish that thought. Because this is, this, this is the honest truth. Even in hurricane season, what season are we in? Summertime, right? So we have season inside of a so even when you find yourself in a bad season, God can create a season right in the middle of your season. Though it may be dry, though it may be hot, though you may be going through, though you cannot see your way, God knows how to cause the wind to blow, though the sand dust is in your eyes. God knows how to create a season right for you. You wonder how long? Don't take long. Touching that, say, don't take long. I'm going to tell you how long it took her. This is quick now. I'm going to tell you how long it took her. As soon as he said, I can't give you the, I can't give bread to, to dogs. Watch this. He insulted her, and some of us would have left the church. You're going to miss your season because you, you leave the church at the wrong time. Well, it seemed like a, it's an insult, but what it really was was a challenge. It challenged her faith. She said, yes, Lord, I am a dog, but even the dogs eat the crumb from the master's table. I, I'm here to tell somebody, take the insult and keep on moving because God got something for you. He may not give it, amen, when you want it, but when you begin to humble yourself and worship him, God will give you the crumbs that you need. I better leave that thought alone before we go into a full flesh. Amen. It is so good to be in the house. Some of you need some time to just say, you know what, Lord? Let me humble myself. Let me re be reminded you're the creator. Uh-huh. See, so, so, sometimes what happens, our mind is in the salvation mindset. And in the salvation mindset, we think of being saved only but that's time when you have to realize he's the creator touch your neighbor say he created everything for his own pleasure and guess what the bible said in, in his uh, goodwill to do good for you don't walk around thinking that god don't want to bless you don't 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 walk around saying it's been too long it'll never happen no it's the lie from the pit of hell a lie. Gotta turn it around. Gotta turn it around. Gotta fix it for your good. I'm so honored tonight because uh, one of my other best friends, see your pastor, one of my best friends too, 
But one of our other best friends is in town. And so, he, he, you know your pastor. <laughs> he can ask me to go to the moon. And if I can do it, I'm going to do it. So I said, hmm, let me see how I can make this work. He said, can you do it? I said, yeah, I'll tell you what we do. <laughs> I said, we, we've been in a funeral all day long. We, we just buried one of our classmates, one of our real dear friends of ours. And so we've been at church all day, or at a funeral all day. And so I said, you know what? It'd be good for us to go down to the other family, extend the family, and get some, some you know, rub shoulders with some, some righteous folks and, and some folks that's encouraged. Is that all right? Yeah. And so when he said that to me, I said, you know what? It'd be good. And uh, I told him, I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go and do it. And I, I, I couldn't see him on the phone, but I know his, his smile just got real big. Amen. So I... In honor of him, I, I came and I wanted to see you all. It's been how many months now? It's been too long, huh? That's okay. You know, if I'm not here in physical, physical uh, form, I'm here in the spirit. Hey, Amen. I love what you have done to the place. It looked beautiful in here. Give yourselves a hand clap of praise. And give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Look how beautiful it is. But you haven't, but can I, can I keep going? You haven't seen the rest of it yet. <laughs> you haven't seen the rest of it yet. The walls are coming down. The building is coming up. And I'm telling you, you know, Pastor Lewis, you saying, I'm, I'm not just talking with my lips. I'm telling you in the spirit. That God wants this church to have revival. He's going to give revival to you. He's going to give you revival. Amen. But, but you, know, you, you know what? When he give it to you, you're going to have to take it. Can you, do you really think the devil is just going to let you this? So the violent take it by. Touch your neighbor and say, sometimes you got to get mad at the devil. Say, now nah, you, you're going to give me my family members. You're going to give me my relatives. You're going to give me back my, my family, my daughters, my sons, my grandbabies. Somebody got to say, you know what? No, no, no. We're going to draw a, a line in the sand. Devil, you can't have no more of my family members. You can't have no more of my children. You can't have no more of my family. No, devil, I'm going to kick you out. Amen. Amen. And when you do that, guess what happens? He respects you if you if you stand up to him. But if you start playing the old poor me mentality, when you have the victim mentality, guess what happens? Then the devil will cause you to be a victim every time. But if you said, you know what? Devil, you ain't pushing me no more. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Now the real preachers in the house. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Are you done? Yeah, I thought it was. <laughs> Did he put a door on it? <laughs> Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated. And we are happy that, amen, Spring of Life made it down to our neck of the woods. Amen. And I know that. With traffic and everything, it, uh, it, uh, I'm sure it was challenging. We, uh, we lost a good man here this past week, and uh, a classmate of ours. He was a little older than us, and so he would give us wisdom at the time we weren't listening. But you know what? He sure was helping us, and we didn't even know it. Looking back, I thank God for Brother Fred Turner. Amen. He was a mighty man of God, and uh, I, I, he was always sharply dressed, and he, he inspired us all. So, Brother Johnson, Brother Ezekiel Johnson, amen, pastors from Phoenix, Arizona, amen, is with us tonight, and uh, he asked, we have to be honest and say, uh, if, if I have some best friends from the first day of Bible college, Brother Jimmy Lewis and Brother Zeke Johnson were my friends. You've heard me tell the story, or you've heard Pastor Lewis tell the story about 
getting to church in that old 1971 Ford Rancher old GT. We went to Pastor Roch's church, and these are the two culprits. We had 20 minutes. They said, there's no way we're going to get there. And 18 minutes later, we were pulling in the parking lot. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, uh, yeah, you know, I'm thankful for the time we had together at Texas Bible College. In fact, Brother Johnson told me today that he preached his first message ever here at Peace Tabernacle in 1990. 1990. So that was a few years ago. But, uh, you know, there are some friendships that I don't ever want to lose. I want to take them to glory with me. Amen. Last Tuesday morning, Brother Shrek Ice and his family came in, and, and Brother Lewis and I was there. And in fact, he had just got off the phone with Brother Turner. Uh, and uh, we was talking about getting together and going to eat somewhere and just to catch up. And, and, uh, but the Lord had other plans for our precious brother who had built many churches, done works for God. But tonight, amen. I don't know what else the Lord has in store, but I'm going to turn this over. Now, he's, he's on Arizona time. And I told him today, sometimes I get home from our Bible study, and uh, he Facebook lives his service, so I just click in and, and watch and listen to him teach sometimes. So if he preaches or teaches anything that you've heard before, he got it from me. <laughs> No, I see, I've got to quote myself, you know. But no, I have appreciated him. And uh, my, the memories that flood. Back to even our freshman year when the freshmen were playing the upperclassmen. He was our quarterback. And I was his center. I may have been the center, but I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, we had some great times of praying together and going to church together, and just uh, worshiping the Lord together. And uh, I'm thankful that he's in Phoenix, Arizona. I can recall back in times past when you told us that you were going to build a church in Phoenix, Arizona. And he is doing that to this day. And I'm grateful that he was able to come our way tonight. And uh, to me, this is a God thing as much as anything. Uh, and so... Uh, I want him to come and take his liberty. Amen. And we're just going to let the Lord move in this place tonight. Amen. Amen. Everybody say, God bless you, Brother Johnson. Lord, we worship you tonight. Hallelujah. You're so worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Sing this. Fall in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I'd have ever done is that the way you feel tonight falling in love with Jesus falling in love with Jesus falling in love with Jesus it's the best thing I'd ever done. Hallelujah. In his arms. In his arms. I feel protected. In his arms. Never disconnected. In his arms. I feel protected. There's no place I'd rather be. 
I'm falling in love with him falling in love with Jesus hallelujah falling in love with Jesus falling in love with Jesus it's the best thing I'd ever done oh yes it's the best thing I'd ever done hallelujah it's the best thing I'd ever done how many feel that way tonight hallelujah falling in love with you Jesus hallelujah hallelujah the one that loved me first the one that paid a price for me that I couldn't pay for myself hallelujah 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 praise God hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah oh hallelujah I'm thankful to be here tonight as your pastor said this was the place where I first preached on a crusade on a crusade TBC crusade one weekend um, I preached here <laughs> praise God and uh, I thank God that he is so good tonight I'm thrilled to be in the house of God tonight thrilled to be back in Texas although not uh, the circumstances I would want to be back here on but praise God because there's divine providence in everything that we do when you're a child of God and you've surrendered your life to him and for him to move you along to put you in places the timing and all those things become critical and I believe tonight God's given me a word for somebody that needs to hear it and praise God we want to just be obedient to God and allow him to move praise God allow him to speak God's profound because he he uses words something that you use to express an idea or a thought to another person but God uses those simple things that we use to relate to other people to deposit profound things in our minds that change the course of our life praise God and tonight if you'll turn in your Bibles to To Mark chapter 10. Hallelujah. Just want to say that I really appreciate your pastor. He's one of those first friends that I met at TBC. A lot of stories. But you know he's a bundle of energy. <laughs> Praise God. And we love him because, you know, he's one of those people that just as my first friends there were people that pretty much came up to me because I wasn't the most outgoing and I thank God for people that do that that have that personality about them and they just I was thinking today we were driving away from the funeral and I was thinking you know I feel so privileged that God has allowed me to even come to Texas to meet people go to Bible College but I met so many people just the southern hospitality that this part of the country is known for is incredible because it took me out of my shell and I thank God for good people kind people loving people that have allowed me to let God work in my life praise God God is in control of it all I think you know we use that word the divine providence there's so much involved in that because God uses so many things seemingly insignificant in our lives but they all form the tapestry that make up who we are praise God we serve that kind of God mark chapter 10 we're gonna start reading at verse number 46 and go down through a few here and they came to Jericho and as he went 
out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Verse number 17 says, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him, verse number 18, that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. Verse number 19, and commanded him to be called, and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good cheer, rise, he calleth thee. And he, and he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man saith unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Father, we're so thankful tonight to be gathered in your presence, in this place, in one accord, God. Listen, listening, God, with our hearts and our ears, God, to hear from you what you will say, what you will do. God, I pray, Lord, that you would have your way. God, that you would bring an answer, God, hallelujah, to someone, Lord, that has a question. For somebody that's looking for hope, God, that you'll restore that tonight, God, that you'll move in lives and hearts and minds to do the work that you've designed for this night to be done. In your matchless, wonderful name, amen, hallelujah, you can be seated. I want to talk to you for the next few moments from this thought, the power of a believing beggar. The power of a believing beggar. Praise God. How many know it's all right to beg? You might not know it's all right to beg. We look down on beggars. We, look, we uh, cast many stigmatisms on a beggar. But sometimes it's all right to beg. Sometimes it's all right for us to get to the place that nothing else matters but what I have a need for. You know, there's something about that that gets God's attention. There's something about when you are desperate, when you are focused, that gets God's attention. Praise God. You know, I'm not going to be before you very long tonight, but I just want to lay some foundation here. In Luke chapter 11, and in Luke chapter 18, there are some stories that Jesus brings out. And these stories are parallel in a sense. Jesus is conveying a thought, a message, a theme, if you will. And in, a, in both of these scriptures, that theme comes through very, very clearly, very strongly. Praise God. In Luke chapter 11, in verse Number five, this is immediately after Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. You know, he goes through, and as soon as he's done, he launches into a story. He's trying to make it practical. It's one thing to understand, you know, the t him giving them instructions, but then to make it practical. How do I use this in my life? He does it with a story, as Jesus did so well, the ultimate storyteller. He says in verse number five of Luke 11, and he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight? Now, think about it. He sometimes uses the extreme to bring out the simple. He uses the extreme to bring out the simple. So he says midnight. That's, you know, everybody's sound asleep. You're in bed. You know it's definitely, you've been there for about six hours. Because they, they uh, went to bed at about six o'clock. So you're in bed about six hours, midway through the night. So that's the example he's using. He says, which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in his journey, has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. 
And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot arise and give thee. Now, of course, in that kind of setup, from the door, the father slept, or maybe the other way around, but everybody was laying you know, in a row from the door. So it was pretty inconvenient to try to wake everybody up to get something done. So he just said, listen, I can't do it. I can't help you. Now, Jesus interrupts his story to bring out his point. He starts with a story, and the stories are pretty powerful. If I were to say, there was a man, all of a sudden, some people that were daydreaming and drifting off just a little bit, I got their attention. There was a man who lived in a mountain behind the lake, and all of a sudden, your mind begins to try to put together this story. Jesus knew how to dr draw you in with a story to begin talking, but he interrupts the story, and he says this, in verse number 7, or verse number 8 rather, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of importunity, he'll rise and give him as many as he needs. So the question is, what in the world is this magic key called importunity? What is it? Because, you know, he establishes friendship. He establishes relationship. And many times we're taught, you know, if you do any kind of sales or any kind of business at all or anything that you do interacting with other people, the power from early on, we understand, is in relationship. You know, you know the saying, it's not who you know, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's relationship oriented. And many things in our world are taught to us. Our minds function and think that way. However, Jesus sets it up by saying they're friends. And then he destroys that notion that the friendship is what's going to make it happen. So he says, this importunity is the reason he'll rise and give him as much as he wants. So what does that mean? What does that word importunity mean? You know, the word desire, the word desire is, uh, it's, it's synonymous with the word wish, and you'll see that as I define it here. It's a strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen, a desire. We're very familiar with it, everybody. A wish, a wish is a feeling or express a strong desire or hope for something that is not easily attainable. Wanting something that cannot or probably will not happen. That's a wish. You see, a desire is actually stronger than a wish. Because a wish is saying that I really don't think it will happen. I want it to, I'd like it to, but I really don't think it's going to happen. And a desire says I have the strong feeling for something. I'd like it to happen. But then there's this other word that that has a slightly different meaning and is quite powerful. And this is the one that the Word of God uses, the word hope. You know, the word hope, many times we use it. You know, our, our language is a living language, and as such, slangs develop, and words, the meaning of words get stretched. Meaning that, you know, for, for one thing, you may use a word, and that was the meaning that it originally was intended to have, but then you'll stretch that meaning out and apply it to other things that it's not meant to apply to. And so we water down the meaning of a word. <laughs> but the word hope is one of those words. The word hope means a feeling or expectation and desire for certain things to happen. Another definition, it's a wish or a desire with the expectation of fulfillment you see within a hope you have a desire you have a wish but now you've added that magic portion to it you believe it will happen praise God and that changes things that changes the way that you approach it praise God Hebrews faith is actually the expectation of hope 
You know, as I said, the definition of hope is a wish or desire with the expectation of fulfillment. Faith is that expectation. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 1, faith is the substance or the expectation of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things that are not seen. Praise God. And you know, it makes you do certain things. When you believe it, you act certain ways. Praise God. And if I were to give you an explanation for what importunity means, you can look it up on Google when you get a chance. The definition they'll give you is a teenager. And you all have teenagers. You all have a mall right around here. And when a teenager wants to go to the mall, they say, Mommy, I want to go to the mall. You say, No. And they say, Okay. And they just walk away. No, they know they can get you to go to that mall. <laughs> so what they begin to do is say, Mommy, can I go to the mall? Mommy, can I go to the mall? Mom, come on, can I go to the mall? Mom. And after you said no, maybe two or three times, but they keep doing it, that's importunity. They're begging. But it's, it's not just begging that's hopeless. They're begging because they know it's going to work. They're begging because they know it's going to happen. Praise God. And when you talk to God, when you deal with God like that, He says that's the power that makes it happen. Praise God. Hallelujah. In Luke 18, we see the same kind of scenario develop, although the characters are now once again on the extreme. You have a judge who doesn't care about anybody. He regards not God or man. So he's not bound. There's no obligation to anybody on his part. He's not obligated. He, doesn't, he has a job as a judge, but it's just perfunctory. He, has no, he doesn't care about you. And as far as God's concerned, he doesn't care about him either. So God really gives us quite a character in the judge, the person that we have to get to do what we want done. And then he has a lady, a widow. Now he once again uses the extreme. Of everybody in society, she's the most vulnerable. Right. Without the help of the judge, she can't just go, and go in there and make things happen herself. She can't. She needs him. Right. And so he's a judge. He has a, a moral responsibility, a legal responsibility to answer her petition. But we, we see some qualifiers or disqualifiers, however you look at it, on his behalf. He doesn't care. He's not attached to obligation that has to do with feelings. He could care less. But the Bible says that this lady went to the judge and something about her presence, something about the way that she was doing things, he said she ain't going nowhere. Come on, make it play. And furthermore, she's going to worry me to death if I don't get up and do something. His motivation had nothing to do with obligation. It was all about his self. Uh -huh. Now, of course, he's in the place of God. God used this person to be the example. But what God was doing is showing it from our point of view. When you've been praying a long time, there's some people that have been praying a long time. And you're almost at the place of giving up. You're almost at the place of saying, it just won't happen. It just won't change. Praise God. And when you're at that place, you look at God and you begin to think, He's not even listening to me. You know, a few years ago, there was a preacher in Georgia who committed suicide. He said, God doesn't hear my prayers anymore. He took his life. Jesus gives us our view of the situation in Luke 18. It's how you see it when you're, when you're getting to the place that you're depressed about it. God, you're not listening. You're not answering. I've been praying about this, and it just seems like it's getting worse. There's nothing happening. You don't care, God. You don't regard me. I, I hear what the preacher's saying. I hear what everybody else is saying. But this thing has not changed. And it doesn't seem like it's going to change. It seems like it's going to stay the same. There's no indication. There's nothing telling me. I don't see any signs that this can change.
And so we feel that way. And if you're not careful, and I'm telling you tonight, it's already happened in somebody's life. You're starting to blame God. You're starting to blame God. God, you don't care. And Jesus gave us this example. From our vantage point, we're looking up. You're an unjust judge, God. You don't care about me. I'm still here. It's been a long time. I'm still here. And it's gotten worse. There's nothing is changing. He gives us our perspective. But the Bible says, Jesus interrupts his story, his own story. He says, although he admits what's going on here, your worst fears, what you suspected, Jesus owns up to what you, what you suspected. He says, though he suffers long. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> though he suffers long with them. I tell you, he'll answer speedily. What that's saying is whatever is hindering, you see, God, he controls the entire universe like we all know, but he coordinates things. God knows how to, out of things that you never see being connected, answer your prayer. The prayer that you've been praying for. God knows the person that he's going to come to intersect with your life that you don't even know. You have never met. You don't know the situation. God sets it all up. Praise God. And in doing that, in doing that, we don't see it coming together. Sometimes God doesn't tell you, this is what I'm going to do. Sometimes there's no indication, there's no hint, there's no nothing but darkness and silence. Yep. Yep. And when it's darkness and silence, you're like this lady. But all you have to do is just... You see, the begging and the knocking, the begging and the knocking. A blind beggar, hallelujah, sat by the side of the road. He was a seasoned beggar. He knew what he was doing when it came to begging. He knew how to beg. Because this is how he made his living. This is, if he didn't beg, if he didn't say anything, if he didn't hold the cup out, if he didn't have the beggar's garment on, people wouldn't know to give to him. So he was all set up to beg. He was all set up to beg. And some of you have got to the place that pride has kicked in. You know what? You can be waiting for God so long that pride kicks in. And pride says, I've been praying too long. You don't care. And if you allow Satan to talk to you, he'll put words in your mouth and feelings in your heart, and soon enough, you'll depart from the living God. It happens that way. It happens that way when people get disappointed with God because they can't see. God can't tell you everything he's doing. He says here, he will answer speedily. As soon as he's able to answer, he'll do it speedily. Nothing will hold him back. Praise God. Nothing will hold him back. There's confidence that you and I can get in that word. There's victory that you and I can get in that word. When you understand that God won't, nothing will hold God back when the time is right. Nothing will hold God back. Hallelujah. Nothing will hold God back. Hallelujah. What a word. Yes, sir. The insertion of importunity into the picture changes everything. Begging is no longer something that's disdained. You know, but here's a qualifier for begging. You have to believe when you're begging. It's so another kind of begging that just whines and complains and says, woe is me. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. But when you believe that something's going to happen, let me give you an example. A few years ago, I had a need. And it was a next day need. All the time that you get and you work out with deadlines being pushed ahead, 
it was the next day need. And so I had preached this message or one very similar to it. And here I am challenged outside in front of my house, dropped my family off after church. And God just told me to start walking. Now I walk and pray around my block. It's about a quarter of a mile. But it was just cold that night, even in Phoenix. <laughs> but I was walking around, and, and, and God just told me, he's just dropped it in my spirit, I want you to pray as if it's the first time, every time you utter these words. Yeah. And I had a certain need, and I said, Lord, I need, Lord, I need, and he says, pray as if it's the first time, every time you open your mouth. You see, the thing that makes us stop, the thing that gets us disappointed, the thing that gets us disgusted, the thing that gets us mad at God is history. When you start to say, I've been doing this too long, your pride says that. That's pride that says I've been praying too long. Praise God. But you have to say, it doesn't matter how long I've been praying. Every time as if it's the first time. God, I need. God, I need. God, I need. Your faith will rise to the occasion. Praise God. When you say that, God, I need. God, this is what I need. God, this is what I need. As if it's the first time. I went around there seven times. On the seventh time, it was thank you, Jesus. I went to bed that night. Didn't have the answer. But I had done what God had told me to do. I felt good about it. Went to bed. Got up the next morning. I got a call from somebody I haven't heard from in quite some time. And while I was on the phone with him, I just felt the Spirit nudge me and say, ask him. Now listen, my pride would say no. But God said, no, do this. And I, I didn't know all the situation. But when I did, he said, well, um, you know, send me this and that. And I did. And make a long story short, God answered it. But then, to show you how it all works... He had a need come up in his life. And over the last few year or two, I've been able to help him tremendously beyond what he blessed me with. But I'm just telling you that God knows what he's doing. Praise God. Even when we don't understand it or we don't see it. Praise God. But God wants us to get, you know, everything. God works with you and I through needs. This is how it works. I mean, if you had no need, God couldn't work with you. Your dependency on God is how God irons the wrinkles and removes the spots. None of us are perfect. None of us are, you know, ready at this moment to go to glory. But God is working on every person. And he works on you through your needs. Praise God. It's your needs that, that bend your ear to hear what he has to say. Because if you didn't have a need in your life, it would be hard for God to communicate because you don't see your need for Him. Praise God. You know, it's very practical. We're, we're, we're very practical beings. You, if you, some, you may like to think that, you know, it's all an intellectual thing with me. Me and God, we're all intellectual. I don't really have a need, you know. I just... But no, everybody has a need. And God works through those needs. Sometimes it's a great thing for you to be waiting on God. Sometimes God works at the last minute because it needs to be done that way. You ever hear of the word brinksmanship? Brinksmanship is something that's usually a geopolitical term that's used to describe negotiations. And those negotiations happen, they really get done at the very last minute. You see it in Congress all the time. Because here's the thing. People are willing to give concession at the last minute that they would never, ever think of giving when they had all the time in the world. And God knows how you and I are. Sometimes it has to go to the very last minute before you'll drop to your knees and surrender, and that's all he was waiting for the whole time. The Bible says this about pride. God resists the proud. In other words, he fights. God's your adversary if you're proud. 
God, you're, sometimes you're waiting because of pride. And you don't even understand it. Pride is there. But this is what God, the reason that God fights against pride is because he said pride goes, it's, it precedes a fall. And God's not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want you to miss it. So if it takes God allowing time to be between you and what you're praying for, to kill pride in your life, to increase your faith in Him, the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. If it takes that, whatever it takes, God is going to do it. Because God loves you. God's working on you. God's working through your needs. God's working through your needs to make you what He wants you to be. Praise God. And He'll continue to do that work until you reach glory. Hallelujah. Let's stand tonight. There is importunity needed in your life. There is importunity needed in my life. Hallelujah. I'm not too proud to beg. But when I beg, I believe Him. I'm begging because I believe. I'm begging because I believe. Hallelujah. Importunity is just not a fancy, dignified word. And what Bartimaeus was doing was not dignified or fancy. As a matter of fact, as he started, when he recognized Jesus was there, he changed his begging. He was begging for money. But then he started begging for a healing. He elevated it. He was begging people for their goods. But when he saw that Jesus was there, or when he heard, because he couldn't see, he heard when Jesus was there, he began to talk to him. He became the focus of the begging. Hallelujah. Other people tried to shut him up. Your own mind, your own will, your own rationale will try to shut you down. Doesn't make sense. You've already done this, already tried this. You are defining insanity, doing the same thing over and expecting different results. The devil is a liar. Yes, sir. I'm going to exercise some importunity. I'm going to exercise some importunity. How bad do you really want it? How bad do you really need it? How bad do you really believe God? Hallelujah. There needs to be a beggar, hallelujah, in this place, hallelujah, that's lost his pride, that's desperate enough to say, God, I'm going to pray, I'm going to beg, I'm going to believe you, hallelujah, and I'm going to exercise some importunity, hallelujah. Where are you at tonight? God knows where you're at, hallelujah. Praise God. God knows where you're at. God knows the prayer meeting you've had with him. God knows the ultimatum that you've set with him. God knows that ultimatum. God knows where your heart is. God knows your heart's breaking. You're, you're tired. You're sick and tired. Hallelujah. God, I want to believe you, but, but, but there's so much history here, God. There's so much history. And the history is making me a doubter. But God, I want to be like the lady. Even though my mind is telling me that you're not listening. Even though my mind is telling me that you don't care. I'm going to be a beggar. Felt warm before Hallelujah. you. Hallelujah. I'm going to be a beggar. I'm going to be a 